Hi everyone. So my name is Sarah. Um, I'm currently going to be a senior in Al Cerrito High School, um, but I'm from Richmond. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen really quick. For my summit project, I decided to present on systemic racism and the ways that it influences the environmental topics that we've been discussing throughout the New Voices Are Rising Summer Academy. What is systemic racism? Systemic racism is racial discrimination that manifests itself in laws and regulations of a society or an organization. It's public policies, institutional practices, or cultural norms that reinforce differences and devalue people of one group as compared to another, which is generally rooted in history. But where can we see systemic racism? in environmental subjects. We can see it negatively affect energy, food, air, housing, and water. So the first topic is energy. So to give some context, African-Americans in America are on average exposed to 1.54 times more hazardous pollution than white people, which is regardless of income. They breathe 56% more pollution than they create, are exposed to 50% higher rates of particle pollution than the general population, are more likely to live near highways, airports, refineries, and other sources of hazardous air pollution pollutants, and are disproportionately exposed to air, toxic air pollution from the fossil fuel industry. POC also tend to struggle to afford baseline energy needs, which is known as energy insecurity, and black households pay upwards of threefolds more than white house, households for energy. But why? Some of the reasons for energy discrimination are that renewable energy options are usually very expensive upfront. Energy itself is not cheap, and many families spend more on energy than on rent. There's also a lack of jobs, economic discrimination and a lack of representation organizations that design energy policies, programs, and products. My second topic is food and food systems. So food insecurity is a term that basically means a condition in which households lack access to adequate food because of limited money or other resources. And because of a history of discrimination, families may have a stable wage, but since they haven't had the opportunities and infrastructure to accumulate wealth, they may um, suffer from food insecurity. The system in America forced Black people into an inferior role in the food system from the very beginning, and the exploitation of their labor allowed America to build a powerful agriculture system that opened the door for further mistreatment, discrimination, and exploitation of other POC. And today we can still see farm workers get mistreated, especially with Latino workers. So if you have one group that worked for no wages and then another group benefiting from that capitalism, it's pretty inevitable that the first group is going to be disadvantaged. So here are some additional statistics. 23% um, of African-American households were food insecure at some point in 2016. Currently in Washington, D.C., one in seven households are food insecure. And farm workers earned just under 60% of what other workers outside of agriculture made in 2020. My third topic is air. Racial and ethnic minorities and lower income groups in the U.S. are at higher risk of premature death from exposure to PM 2.5 air pollution than other population and income groups. Studies have shown that high-income African-Americans who had higher income than white people still face greater risk than those white people. Other factors that may be playing a role um, may be stress due to result of discrimination. Groups may face greater exposure to pollution because of factors like racism, class bias, housing market dynamics, and land costs. Pollution sources tend to be located near disadvantaged communities, which increases exposure to harmful pollutants. Lack of access to healthcare and grocery stores, poorer job opportunities, dirtier workplaces, Higher traffic exposure and et cetera may expose some groups to health threats due to their disadvantage. My fourth topic is housing, which lower wages along with the historical discrimination that prevented them from owning homes and building wealth means that people of color are more likely to rent and also more likely to struggle affording that rent. Housing segregation basically means certain jobs and stores are located in certain communities, and it also determines where parks are located, if streets are repaired, if toxic dump sites are built nearby, et cetera. And personally, um, I live in a neighborhood that's pr predominantly um, POC, and I don't see many organic grocery stores over here. It's mainly liquor stores, and that does have to do with housing segregation as well. Throughout the New Deal, the Federal Housing Administration subsided home builders that were mass producing subdivisions for white people only, which basically means that federally supported homes were explicitly prohibited, prohibited from being sold to mi minorities. And housing segregation did not happen by accident, but rather through intentional public policy such as red lighting in the 1930s where black and brown areas were labeled by the government as hazardous or undesirable, quote unquote. And here's a figure um, basically explaining the racial and ethnic composition by housing type. And as we can see, most home homeowners are white. My fifth topic is water. And to give some more context, too many people in the US and Puerto Rico currently don't have access to running water and basic indoor plumbing. Latino and African-American households are twice as likely than white households to lack indoor plumbing, while Native Americans are 19 times more likely. 
The lack of safe water and indoor plumbing goes back generations to communities that were built informally in remote areas away from the infrastructure grid. In some of the Texas colonias, low-income families thought they would eventually get water when they built on their plots. It's very common to see poor tribal and immigrant communities to be excluded from water access initiatives. Apart from the limited federal and local government budgets, most residents in these low-income areas cannot afford to pay water updating systems. In the colonias alongside the Texas and Mexico border, many residents are unsupervised private wells that have unpredictable water quality and availability. And the water crisis that we saw in Flint, Michigan is a great example of racial in inequities in water access, where local officials failed to treat tap water exposing nearly 100,000 residents, more than half of whom are black, to dangerous levels of lead and other contaminants. But why is this all important? I think it's important to be educated on such issues like environmental injustices, because what might be normal for us like clean water or a house in which to live can be an unrealistic privilege for someone else. But we must begin by speaking about these issues and the deeper rooted issues that come alongside them, like systemic racism, as a first step towards combating them. We can't ignore these issues for any longer nor stay silent about them. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.